and welcome to Furious Driving. And today you join me at the wheel, not of a car, but of one of the most popular vehicles of the 1970s and 80s. This is a Bedford CF. Wow, I'm in a van. And if you like reviews of interesting, unusual vehicles, then please do hit the like and subscribe buttons below. Now on with the review. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving. And if you grew up in the 80s, 70s, even the 90s, a familiar sight on every street in every town in Britain, and well, most of Europe in fact, would have been one of these, a Bedford CF. This was astonishingly popular, but when did you last see one on the roads in the UK? I'm guessing it was a long time ago, but today we're taking this one, a drop side body no less, out for a drive. Let's take a look around. So before the Bedford CF came along, there had been a vehicle called the Bedford CA. It was, again, hugely popular and ran for 17 years until 1969 when it was replaced by this, the CF. However, that was the original CF. This, though, is a CF1 facelift, and the CF1 came out in 1980. The main difference is being the front end treatment. And it was available in three body styles. There was a panel van, which had sliding doors on the back, but it was very popular with all kinds of people, with the police, ambulance services. The army had lots of them. They were everywhere. Ice cream men. Then, of course, there were dormobiles, the caravanettes, which is one of the most popular caravan conversions of a motorhome through the last, well, 30 or 40 years. And and finally, of course, there was this version here, which wasn't sold with the wooden bed on the back of it, it was sold as a chassis cab. The monocoque of the van was shrunk down to just a cab on its own on the chassis legs, which were sold bare, so a coach builder could then create whatever they wanted to on the back. In this case, it was a drop-sided wooden thing, perfect for builders, scaffolders, who knows who used this van. So the styling of this thing really was quite modern and futuristic, but it could have been even more so. Now, prior to this coming out in 1969, Bedford had been working on a new van, an intermediate sized model called the CD, which would have been massively futuristic. It looked like a concept car from a Jerry Anderson movie. It was amazing and a, a shame it didn't go into production because it would have put everything else 20 years behind it. However, Ford blew it out of the water when they brought the Transit out in 1965 and suddenly Bedford had to rethink absolutely everything and they needed a large intermediate sized van that did everything a Transit could do but a little bit better. And so they took the Transit as their best basis for size, carrying capacity, load space, and that's what they came up with. It's a monocoque shell using a lot of Vauxhall parts being parts. However, they've made new commonality. So things like these doors were designed to be the same across a wide range of different uh, commercial vehicles. And where the monocoque sits underneath and has to take more weight, it's a far thicker grade of steel than you would find in a car. Now the major differences between the CF and the CF1 were under the bonnet and the bonnet itself. Because under the bonnet there was a range of engines that were generally a little bit smaller in the original vans, but then come along to the later version, the CF1, and we got a 2.3 litre four cylinder slant four. There was also a two litre version for export markets where they were hit by heavy tax for larger capacities as well. Now the front of it got a revised styling for 1980 with this big plastic grille which made it look a lot more modern. Although I do really like the metal pressed style of the original CF. And that original style does look an awful lot like an American counterpart, the Chevy van from 1970-71, which was in no way related being you know, an American product, but being a GM product as well, there must have been some collaboration between the design people because the styling is so, so similar. Now, usefully here at the front, this new end can be removed with just eight bolts. So if you need to access the engine and take the entire front end mechanically apart, you can undo eight bolts, lift the panel work away, and you're in there. Previous to this, if you needed to get to the engine, apart from the uh, little hatch in this cabin, you had to go underneath to take it out. The CF1 was updated to the CF2 in 1983 on an A-plate. The major differences were inside the cabin, but outside the way you tell the difference is it went from metal door handles like this to plastic door handles, and I think the mirrors changed as well. So there were three distinct monocoque styles of body. There was the panel van, which was so, so popular, it made its way into every walk of life. Then, of course, there was the caravanette, the motorhome. And then this, the bare chassis cab, which came with a truncated end just here, obviously monocoque again, rear window, and then the chassis rails beneath, which could have been everything from a bin lorry to a tipper truck to a flatbed like this. Now, obviously, we don't know what this was used for, probably a builder's merchant, but 
move on 20, 30, 40 years to, well, the turn of the millennium, and you would see these things rolling around your local housing estate with the rag and bone men hawking their wares, asking for any old iron, and this was a common sight with a, a slightly down at heel, tired Bedford CF with a few old bridges and bikes in the back. So access to the engine isn't really through the bonnet. There's not a lot you can de do or see down here. You've got access to the radiator, your fan belts, auxiliary belts, and that kind of thing. You change maybe a air filter, there's not a lot more. I'll show you through the cab so you can properly see it. So this is how, for the most part, you get at the engine if you need to service the carburetor, the spark plugs, anything like that at all. This is the 2.3 litre Slant 4, common to many, many Vauxhalls, including the Firenza. So basically, we've got a hot sports car engine here. Well, I don't think it's tuned quite as hotly as that. The power output range of that engine is from about 69 to just over 100 in most applications, uh, in most 60s and 70s these Vauxhalls with uh, any grunt shared this same motor. This is probably low 70s in this particular application. Now here you can see how it would look normally in day-to-day -day use. You've got the big recess for maps, clipboards, worksheets, that kind of thing. And underneath that we've got ourselves a big, well fairly decent sized ashtray here in the centre so that anyone in any of the three seats can use it because this is a split bench, two on the left and the passenger side and one for the driver moving independently. Up ahead we have got the biggest metallic T-shelf you've ever seen, designed to take your knees off in the event of an incident. This is actually not only a very, very useful double-sided T-shelf, it's got a rear side which is facing up right now, but you can lower this down uh, like a tiny, very wide, painful bonnet on this little uh, bonnet prop. This is actually so that you can uh, make enough space to get the engine cover out when you need to move that, otherwise there's not enough room to do it. But then put it down and you've got this uh, faux metal painted T-shelf area here. It's quite low, so you're not going to get a cup of tea in there then, but it clips up on that small clip at the back. And uh, yeah, being 1980, pretend painted metal wood was a thing. The current owner has added this retro style DAB radius, make it look good. Then we've got a sort of almost padded rubber covered dash top up here to make it uh, more T-shelf area availability. Now, moving across to the main dashboard binnacle, we have got the simplest dashboard you've ever seen. Just one big speedo here in the centre with a couple of small subdials. We've got fuel, we've got temperature, and a few warning lights, literally nothing else, and just three rocker switches on the right-hand side and your heating and ventilation controls on your left, and even those are excessively basic. And, of course, we do have a choke control on this one because it is... 1980s and this you may notice is actually a Volkswagen um, hazard warning switch from I think from a Polo or early Golf and then we have this pull-out switch here which is for the rotating beacon on the roof which is very very loud indeed it sounds a bit like the punchline to those horror stories where your car breaks down your friend goes to go and get help and you hear a banging on the roof and it comes back and it's the maniac is bouncing their head on the roof that's kind of what the beacon sounds like most of the time but here it is rotating dazzlingly in the sunshine. Now over to the doors. They are an astonishingly tall door. They go all the way to the top and to the bottom. But you'll notice this bottom end does wrap around the sill area of the thing and you've got a big step to climb up through built in inside the door. All black paint at the bottom because you don't see it when the door's shut. Then we have uh, chromey plasticky stuff uh, for the window winder and also a chromey plasticky thing for the door handle pull as well. Looks kind of 1980s, 70s smart. Doesn't feel premium, but it feels solid enough to get the job done. And then we have a bit of an embedded pattern in the door card as well to make it a bit more interesting. Then we have this really unusual cutout in the top of the window. There's a bunch of stories about this. This is either so you can leave the windows on the crack and not mist up, because uh, they're fully shut with a bit of an airflow through it, or so people could smoke and the smoke could be sucked out the window, or just for general airflow, because when you've got three farting builders in there, it lets the uh, bit of extra ventilation through. The steering wheel is very cool with the Bedford version of the Vauxhall Griffin here on the steering wheel. A two-spoke affair, but you'll notice it is almost horizontal. It's like a bus wheel as you uh, look at it from the side, so you do have to adopt that bus driver, van driver's hunch over as you sit in there. Just a couple of basic stalks on the left and the right. We've got our indicators on the left and our horn on the right. Mmm, van, Papi. Now there's not much down here apart from this aftermarket radio, there was nothing here from new.
but looking overhead, apart from the perforated vinyl headlining, the owner has added a period correct uh, tannoy style speaker up in the headlining to make it look as it would have been next to the only fitting in the roof, which is that little light. Now coming down here, we had three choices of gearbox. The gear shift itself is weirdly cantilevered over to get it near the driver because of that staggered three seat arrangement. This is a four speed manual. There was also a five speed manual and a three speed automatic. That being a GM source automatic. So it's a big step up into the van. Door clang shut with a proper old van clang. Then some things like the seat belts feel very car-like. Let's get into neutral, start up. And it's such a long, long reach down to the handbrake. And first is sort of in the middle. You have to kind of learn that central position. And off we go. It revs so easily. And the clutch is an interesting one. It's a very heavy pedal, but the actual take up is incredibly gentle. So you get a very smooth drift away from the line. And it's quite peppy, surprisingly peppy. And the 2.3 litres does deliver a fair bit of oomph. There's lots of torque as well. You can be pulling uphill like I am now. Fourth gear and it's still got loads of power to drag itself up the hill. I'm actually on the white lines because there's a GoPro on the left and the hedge is sticking out quite a long way. And I don't want to whip the GoPro off with the hedges. That would be a bad thing to do. The gear shift is a little bit wandery. It's not a lot of feel and it's more experience and luck that leads you to find a, a ratio you want in there. However, once you've learned it, it is quite smooth and easy to, to flick through them if you know where you're going with it. The brakes, there's a lot of travel when nothing happens and then suddenly they bite quite hard. you do almost straight away adopt the traditional Volkswagen style of driving hunched over for two reasons. Partly because the steering wheel is low and flat and you have to lean across it to reach top. And secondly, the top of the windscreen is so low. If I'm sat upright, I can't see where I'm going. So I have to hunch forward to be able to see anything out the front. The steering is very, very light indeed. Much lighter than I thought it would be, to be perfectly honest. And surprisingly accurate. There's what feels like it's going to be a little bit of play with the car, the van, does wander with it immediately. It really is brisk off the line. 30 miles an hour already, it feels rapid. And the ride is not bad actually, it's quite civilized. It's a bit jolty in the back. Obviously, it's an empty load bed and it's sprung for weight. It uses the same basic layout as a Vauxhall Victor. It's uh, coil springs and struts at the front, live rear axle in the back with leaf springs. It means it can take a lot of weight. And it doesn't handle that badly either. Imagine the Volkswagen van that actually went quickly. That's kind of what we've got here. Now the entire time, 17 years, this was in production, it was always benchmarked against its chief rival, the Transit, which was the one that set the precedent. But it always played second fiddle to us to a certain extent. It was always number two in the sales charts, but it's these that I remember way more than the transits, even though I'm sure the transits were more about, obviously they were, they sold more. But these were hugely popular with government agencies, the army, ambulance services. In fact, a lot of ambulance services kept these and brought a load in, like Rover ST1s, when they went out of production 
in 1987, they bought a job lot of them so they could keep on using them for longer. Obviously they kept on moving the technology along and improving things. And in 1982, there was even an electric version, which was the first ever EV based on a fossil fuel platform that was commercially available. I should add that caveat. But it was very expensive and didn't find many buyers outside of government agencies. So mostly they went to people like the post office. The production didn't last too long and after production ended, supplies dried up pretty fast. They also did a prototype of a four-wheel drive version as well. They were thinking they could have used it in the construction industry. I'm sure the police and the army would have liked it as well. After production finished in 1987, they didn't really have a proper replacement. They had a tie-up with Isuzu, which made a thing called the Bedford Midi, which is based obviously on a small Isuzu. And they did the tiny Bedford Rascal based on a Suzuki. But there was nothing really in the same carrying capacity as this. Not until the late 90s when they tied up with Renault and we had the uh, Movano, as it was known in the UK on the, uh, I think it was a Vina, I think they called it in uh, Opal Markets. So it was a long time giving Ford a lot of uh, sales opportunities. But of course, this wasn't only sold in the UK. It was sold all across Europe under the Opal area where it was badged as an Opal Blitz which seems like a strange choice of name for a German car company to use. But the tie-ups don't end there. As production of this one wound up, Bedford had been talking to British Leyland with the intention of creating a world van to go everywhere. But sadly, that didn't come to anything. That could have been quite remarkable. Now, outside of government agencies and other straight-laced users of these vans, the other notable uh, customer base for the CF were customizers. Because this thing looked so much like the Chevy van over in America, and it had a few more interesting curves, and a, that nice face on the, uh, the pre-facelift CF, this became a massive favorite with hot rod and custom people. Van culture was a big thing in the 70s. There were magazines dedicated to it. If you were going to gas a suspension and glitter paint a van in 1978, it was going to be a CF. OK, so good things for the CF. The steering is very light and very precise. The brakes are strong. The gear change is easy once you know where it is. And the clutch action, although heavy, just takes up with such a delightfully smooth bite it's actually rather pleasant to use and you do very quickly forget how much is behind you it's like driving a very tall car the bad things are you do forget how much is behind you you could easily clip something on a roundabout forgetting there's several meters of timber and steel behind you my main complaint with this thing really though is the seating position which although it's very very comfortable it's that hunch, and this is set down as low as it'll go. It, it is an adjustable height seat, but why you'd want it adjusted any higher than this is beyond me. Already, I'm virtually touching the ceiling, and I can't see out the window. And the engine does sound a little bit tappity, but I'm told by the owner that that's not a bad thing. If you can't hear the tappets, it means you've run out of oil. It is so easy to just wend it down these country lanes. It's actually really quite fun. One thing I am aware of is the width of it. It does feel particularly wide in the hips when you are down a narrow bit of country road with an oncoming wide vehicle towards you. I know I've said it about twice before in this video, but I'll say it one more time. These things were everywhere. If you grew up in the 80s, the Bedford CF is part of your childhood, whether you like it or not. The ice cream van that came down your road, that was a Bedford CF. If you had a milkman and he wasn't using an electric float, chances are it was a CF. If you went to hospital, it was in a CF. 
they were literally everywhere. It is such a shame. They've all but vanished now. I looked on eBay last night. Do you know how many were on eBay yesterday? Three. And one of them was a wreck needing restoration. And one of the others was £7,000. So, uh, yeah. But I have been thinking about some kind of camper van project for a while. And this does make me think, as I have been already, to be honest, a CF might be the perfect basis for it. Well, thanks for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed this ride out in this brilliant old flatbed truck. You've got to love a CF. It makes me want to go and hit eBay and start hunting for a van version to convert into a camper of some kind. I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, as always, do please smash that like button, hit that subscribe button, and join me again next time we're driving something completely different. Mm-hmm.